So when I think about contemporary engagement, I guess I'm today wanting to talk about uh, some of what I see and what I see my clients are doing and starting to happen in this world of engagement because it's not, um, it's not done yet. It's not uh, completed its development. And so that um, I'd like to start this morning by talking about the first of the major earthquakes that occurred in Christchurch in November 2011. <coughs> so that was um, an earthquake that occurred early on a Saturday morning. And in the week or so that followed, there was um, probably what was the, what we thought would be the most tragic of announcements, only to have that surpassed in February, which came from Sanitarium. <laughs> It was to say to us and give us full frank information for Marmite lovers, both in New Zealand and in Australia, that the only plant in the world that made the recipe of Marmite that is eaten in New Zealand and Australia was damaged mortally by the earthquake. And that it would take at least six or seven months before they would be able to make any more Marmite. You laugh. But of course, you are really a Vegemite nation. <laughs> <laughs> they took it very seriously, as sanitarium is wont to do. It made me realise is that they didn't quite understand the full dynamics of contemporary engagement on religion. <laughs> because they thought they had the stock supply of Marmite for the nations of New Zealand and Australia. But they didn't seem to understand that families like mine had the one in the fridge, one in the pantry policy. And that what happened over the following six, seven, and it turned out to be nearly 12 months, was that social media and community commentary started to talk with one another about the social supplies of Marmite, <laughs> where they could get more. We had people gifting one another Marmite, should they not be able to get through their morning requirements. There were famous chefs, chefs who gave advice that really should only apply it to toast, because the warmth of the toast meant the Marmite went further. It was the equivalent of using less water, I assume. <laughs> and if you talk to the folks from Sanitarium now, what they realised is that they had a community of Marmite eaters, which wasn't simply about the social transaction and the commercial transaction of money for edibles. It was an identity. I'm a Marmite eater. I'm a Vegemite eater. In our household, it was an opportunity for me as a Vegemite eater to basically to bring my Marmite eating partner to the dark side of Vegemite. <laughs> And that almost worked until the grand announcement that said Marmite is back. And so when we think about engagement as a business tool, it's not simply about the selling in this case of Marmite. It is about using the power and the dynamic of the community of people that you engage with. It is about adding to the standing and confidence that we have in those organisations but inevitably, as it was in the Marmite crisis, a chance for a community to feel they were doing something about the smallest of problems, as we would dis discover off the back of major community challenge from an earthquake. And that's the essence of the change of thinking about engagement. It's no longer the thing you do on the edge where you find a place for it to sit. It's much more part of thinking about the essence of who we are as an organisation and what, how we get what we need to get done, done. So that when we think about Marmite, we're really thinking about contemporary engagement. For those of you curious, my Marmite eating partner is still a partner and is still wayward in their ways. <laughs> But essentially, engagement is changing. And it's changing because communities expect it to change. It's changing because episodic engagement, when we need people's permission to do something, is no longer a sustainable nature of the relationship we're looking to have 
with communities, and it means that if we approach communities only when we need them, we have to go through that process of reintroduction, and we lose all of the value that we have made in previous interventions. When we think about and changing engagement, there's some reasons that it has become most dramatically different in the last few years. You can probably tell that the scare colour is acquired through the application of modern science itself, and so that um, I've been around for a while, so that um, engagement used to be a necessary evil, and in some organisations it still is. Is anybody working in an organisation where engagement is a necessary evil? No. Oh, just the one. Right, okay. Yeah, I think you're just brave. Actually, other people will seek you out. In the, I just couldn't put my hand up. Shall we try that again? Is anybody living or working in an organisation where engagement is a necessary evil? Just the two, three, four of you, five of you? Oh, it's, that's all. Are you all working for the same organisation? We'll just have to check. But essentially, when we think about what those drivers are, do you mind if I walk past the screen? Otherwise, is it, it's all right, you'll be fine, won't they? That's lovely, I feel better already. Um, so because I, now I get to be close to you, and I get to spend time with this poll, which I've been wanting for the whole morning. <laughs> um, so that when we think about what those drivers are for engagement, they, essentially they come out of three domains. They come out of changes in how communities operate, and the nature and profile of communities. They come out of the changes and dynamics for organisations, and essentially they also are out of how we are now engaging and the changes that um, in how we practice. Increasingly, we are unreasonably, as clients and citizens, expecting those organisations to fix wicked problems. You know what a wicked problem is, don't you? Hairy, audacious, hard to get a hold of. You think you've got it fixed once and then tomorrow happens and you discover you've got another bit of it. And the one thing that is the engagement essence of a wicked, wicked problem is that no one organisation can fix it. No matter how wealthy they are, bright and talented, it requires the actions of both those who are affected by the problem and those who seek to fix the problem. So the first change is what we expect of organisations, and that's about wicked problems. The second dynamic, which has been evident around just about every Western country in the world and beyond, is that people increasingly are simply saying no. No more money, no more rates, no more taxes. Yes, we want more, but actually not one more dollar from me. We're not sure you spend our money well, and actually I can't afford you. And again, we have that unreasonable expectation of still wanting services or aspiring to better quality, but also knowing that when we look at our own budgets, that's not something that we can fund. And so that, that has required organisations, local governments and governments alike to really have a fundamental rethink, not about engagement, but about how it does its work. And increasingly, organisations are looking to communities to um, self-manage work or to have NGOs or other organisations actually doing the work that used to be theirs. And so that's been a fundamental shift, generally uh, created by that fiscal um, pushback from people like me that say, oh, we can't for my money and you can't have any more of it. Thanks for asking. <laughs> This is a picture taken by my sister. She lives at Waihi Beach. And in New Zealand, there was a um, grounding of a very large container ship on a, a reef called the Astrolab Reef. It had been there for a very long time. And so people were a bit surprised that the ship drove into it, but it did. 
And um, because it drove into it, this beach, which is probably about 100 kilometres from where the ship actually hit the reef, um, disgorged all their containers, which were basically full of milk powder, because it was from New Zealand. New Zealand milk powder, it was like a repatriation process. <laughs> and so on her morning we at walk, Catherine, who is the least political person I've ever met in my life, that's why everybody says she's lovely, <laughs> that's another picture altogether, she took this photo and because she can and she likes Facebook, she popped it on Facebook and she was trying Twitter out so she popped it on Twitter and she put this little phrase that said, you know, would you like milk with your tea? Well that just went viral for a moment. Catherine was famous, she loved it, you know, it's quite surprised. She tried it again with a picture of the cat, it almost worked. <laughs> But for decision makers, the reality is that there's no backyard anymore. You can't make a mess and not have other people know. And that's because people like this take photos. Hopefully some of you are tweeting what I'm saying. Are you? Okay. <laughs> there's meerkats and periscope. There's every sort of way that your experience should and can be shared with the world. And so there's no backyard anymore. Reputations are damned by people who've never met you because they read it somewhere from someone they've never met. This is for you. Normally it's got monks on it when I do this slide, but I thought, hey, it's a water, water conference. So <laughs> later on there's a picture, there's a presentation about how we're consuming water. I haven't heard it, but I'm guessing that one of the changes will be we're not um, turning the tap on so much anymore and we're putting it in a bottle. Are they, is the person who's delivering it? That's my best bet, yeah? If I'm right, feel free, just you know, give me money. <laughs> um, and that's because we do everything in terms of mobility. When we do engagement on transport changes in New Zealand, we do it in the 20 minutes when people are on buses and trains in New Zealand because it's when we do all our personal administration. Is that true for you? Anybody uh, clear Facebook pay accounts, uh, check out the world, respond to things, uh, set, sort out what's happening later in the day, you know, make uh, appointments for when the cat needs to be, have an injection. Do we all do that while we're in public transport? We live our life in a mobile way. And so expecting us to do any engagement in anything other than a mobile way is um, mad. But what it also means is that um, a week is forgotten. And so beautifully scheduled engagement doesn't work. We expect our organisations to know us really well because we, they in effect can communicate to us in the pockets near to parts of our body that only very good friends get to. And so mobility has dramatically changed what we expect of organisations. We expect them to be faster and more agile and in tune. And we expect to be able to respond to you in the moment in that way. We're more connected. We don't necessarily have more friends. In fact, we've become choosier about them, the research would tell you. And we have social networks that are more formally contained. But we're more connected to the world, unshaped by the opinions of people who live in countries which are not mine. To understanding, well, did you do all the fuss about the birth of Princess, what's her name? Charlotte, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then the speculation on her name is obviously going to be Charlotte. I mean, you know, <laughs> Olivia, what were they thinking? <laughs> um, and we can do that because I'm connected. I'm not connected because I watch the news at six o'clock every night. I'm connected because I pay attention to it. Some of you will be tracking things through the day while you're watching the witty and charming presentation person from New Zealand. Or, or that people are now looking up. Lovely. <laughs> and really part of that is this, which is we have the potential, like my lovely sister from Waihi, to be famous. And why wouldn't you? Yes, I was there when something really bad happened. And instead of helping, I thought I'd take a little small video shot of it. <laughs> yeah. And then upload it onto one of the sites. You know, you know, I might get onto morning television as well. 
And so that desire to be famous, to be known, to have my voice visible to the world is changing how we're engaging. We've got clients who not only ask people what they think, not only run great workshops, but basically make the documents that they're looking to create visible and available online so people can see their words and amendments typed directly into the products that are being produced. And it's our equivalent of how I can be famous, even for a very short time. And this is really a factor of age, and I now look at the audience and think, I should just get rid of this particular slide. But I'll just tell you, because it's sort of like in the old days, this group in particular are going to need this. Um, in the old days, people only knew things if I told them. You know, they came to be informed because they didn't know anything until we did. Now they come and they've Googled us. And they can tell us how things are worked in Uzbekistan and why aren't we using that model. They may not be right, by the way, accuracy isn't a requirement, but they do feel like they know everything because they don't need you to tell them. And so when they go to something where you spend a lot of time telling them stuff, it's kind of like you don't get them. And so essentially that impact of Google has changed how we think and what we know. And so even if we wanted engagement as it used to be done, even if we're looking for engagement as it uh, could have been done, it's just not there anymore. And what that has changed is essentially the nature of the relationship between communities and governments and local governments and corporates alike. And so um, this is a very New Zealand ad, but this was written about one of the um, projects that we were managing. So this is an ad for a beer. And uh, this is how it works. There are larger billboards over New Zealand. And there'll be a statement on this side. And then there is the New Zealand knockdown comment, which goes like this. This is the tone, which is, yeah, right. You probably don't have that, do you? No, you have that slightly cynical tone in the past, <laughs> yeah. Well, in New Zealand, it's like, yeah. So the, last, the, set, the right hand side only works if you, in your head, go, yeah, right. And so that one of my um, clients, before we worked with them, had a phrase where they assured local residents that they wouldn't hear the turbines. Yeah, right. And within seconds, this became an ad for a beer. But essentially, it goes to the heart of people not really believing what my clients tell them, even though generally my clients are honest, they are of good intent, and they haven't killed babies for weeks. <laughs> but they are overcome with people who actively operate like they're there to make their life unlivable in a determined way. And it's hard for my clients not to take that person <coughs> because they are sincere, good people doing stuff that they know needs to be done. But it underpins a change to how we need to think about and what we need to think about in engagement. And so when I think about what the impact of that is, is that essentially every day the face of engagement is changing and we need to change with it. It changes how we use engagement. It changes it because people don't need us to ask for them to tell us what they think. They don't need to wait for the program that we've got scheduled. It changes because decision makers are much more almost irrationally focused on reputational risk and over respond to the one voice of no or complaint. It makes the nervous decision makers to do the right thing. And decision makers, partially out of that nervousness, have become, and partially because of the fact that they know that they can get an opinion number very quickly, is that they want to know whether what they're doing has the support 
of the communities that they're making decisions for, particularly around tough decisions. The attentions and confidence of decision makers. It also means that, um, and your slide was, I loved it, you know, there was no colluding, um, is that increasingly no one organisation, particularly for big stuff, steps out by themselves and say hello for our metropolitan water. Yeah? What they say with all of these other people, because increasingly organisations are looking to partner with other stakeholder organisations, particularly on big stuff. And they're wanting to say, of course we are connected up. Partially because communities kind of expect you to be connected up, but mostly because often if you're working on wicked problems, you have to be connected up. And um, one of the phrases that has entered into the lexicon of engagement out of the UK in particular is the concept of poking. You, you know that, don't you? Yes. You're good with that? Oh, look, there are some, some people pretending they don't know. There you go, okay. Poking is when you poke others to do something, yeah? So for all of you are in the behaviour change kind of way, it's where you want to move people into action. And out of the UK, the phrase that uh, got generated, hi, how are you, come on in, grab a seat, is uh, poking others to do more or to change what they do. It's basically to build a momentum in the community. Come on down, yep, you've got a friend. Yep, that's right, you saved your seat. It's all right, don't blush, we can't see it from here. <laughs> And the other change is that increasingly in engagement we are expected not simply to run the beautiful workshop, but we're expected to become very skilled in that mass engagement techniques. They're cheaper, they often produce numbers, and they're um, absolutely aligned to a mobile nation. And by the way, for those of you who think that mobility is simply an issue for young people, only young people use phones, but you know, transacting, actually you're just wrong. I'm sorry. Even people my age transact life. What fiscally significant transactions on the cell phone? Add to it an iPad for those of us who have eyesight problems. Um, and it's true for everyone. So actually that wave is moving very quickly. In this country, you've got more cell phones than you've got people. So while well, there are parts of the community who never ever use it, actually that's becoming a very small part of the community. And sometimes that collates or coincides for the people who show up at the things that we run. So think about the last time you ran a workshop and think about the age demographic of the people you had in the room. A little bit older. There will be also always people who come for the sausage rolls, that's different. <laughs> but essentially it is about using that kind of different range of techniques. Our engagement challenge here is to do high tech and high touch because actually Great engagement has both of those things in place. But we can't ignore this, because in doing so, we don't give our decision makers any confidence that we've got the carry of the view of their communities. And so it's easy to knock the confidence of the decision maker when they think that you've missed it. But what that means for engagement, if particularly any of you, who's done an IAP2 piece of training? Yeah? Oh, the rest of you just pretending at you, there's still time. It's all right, there isn't an age restriction. It is that um, engagement used to be described, or public participation used to be described as only being a conversation which was essentially about when you as an organisation had something you wanted to do and you wanted to go and talk to the community about what their reaction was to that. In a what do you reckon kind of way, through to them um, shaping or, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, changing what that looked like. But actually when we think about um, engagement now, 
and we think about it, it looks like this. And so this is actually, what's the date today? 1990. Oh, look, it's only 11 months old. Damn, you had to hold this in a month, it would be great. So essentially this is a new model of thinking about what um, engagement needs to think about, we'll just touch on it briefly today. Um, which is the dynamic is that of, has this got a point on it? No. <coughs> Here's one I prepared earlier, see? So down this side is thinking about where is the source of the leadership point for um, the engagement. And if we just think about that very simple dynamic of an organisation or in the community. And down the bottom is essentially who's going to do it. Yeah. Now, the only thing we ever really did fight about with this particular model was the colour of the pick of each of the cells. I lost the fight about the bottom left hand. I'm told that the colour is torp. Good. So here is when you're engaging about actually the things that you're planning to do or to have control over. Lots of the engagement that we do falls into that cell, yeah? So this is when we're asking people about stuff we're planning to do. If you want to go to an engagement conference and look chic, this is the colour to be. This is very cool. And this is behaviour change. So this is when the organisation is leading the conversation, but essentially they're looking for action, behaviour change, or... Um, uh, a shift actually in the communities, and lots of your work sits in that arena. Who would sit in this arena principally? Yeah, we've got one, lots, lots. Oh, look at that, wash it, okay, all right. No need to show off, you all look cool, it's good. So, um, and actually, if we were to think about taking that here, it really goes to the heart of what you were talking about, Alison, which is it's no longer that short-term sense of behaviour change, actually it's about life change. And so your colleagues who are running the health conference not far from here, they'll be sitting over here, you're sitting over here, because actually you can't live with a bounce. You can't. Doesn't seem to be a problem, it rains all the time, we're good. And so that's that behaviour change. Up into the uh, top uh, quadrant is, um, no not quadrant, that's four cell, is essentially um, when communities have a point of view about what needs to happen, they're not looking to take on the action, they're looking to change your reaction and your action. And so there are lots of community groups who set themselves up and essentially they are advocacy groups wanting to change the opinion and possibility of what um, key target organisations do. So even if you're engaging here, Unless they didn't know you were coming, you've probably got an agency who's operating out of the yellow. Yeah? Would that be true? I only need three nods just to check. One, two, three. That's it. Got the idea? The pink in the top right far side, which is all the way over there, is actually where the community is leading and doing. It's when they're quietly getting on doing stuff. Sometimes actually they don't want government or non-government organisations involved because actually they quite like what they're doing and they just like to get on doing it. And so that really in that um, uh, cell, our job is simply to back them to do it even better. If they're doing something that's helpful and they like having leadership of it, our job is capability and capacity building and empowering to have them help that do, you know, do that even better. But that's engagement. And in the centre, not because it's the aspire to spot, just because it sort of fits there and can come from any of the other cells, is where essentially we need not only to, um, where we need to have shared leadership and shared action. We need to have people partnered up to agree, this is the thing we're going to do, and then we're going to do it. Either together or you know, separately, but we're going to do it together. This is the new map for engagement. It is not simply contained here. Yeah? It's simply 
um, actually flows all of it. And our job as engagement professionals is essentially to work the hive. How do you use and be aware of all of those segments? Yeah. So with the person you're sitting next to, take um, 30 seconds to just have you know the quick chat looking at the hive to think where does your work sit mostly? I know some of you will sit everywhere, I get that, it's fantastic. But when you think about most of your work, you know, in that cool and groovy kind of way, and you can't all be in the light blue, even though it's the cool bit, yep. Um, just take 30 seconds to chat about where do you reckon your work sits? <laughs> your microphone guy, just sort of, that he hears exactly when I'm wanting you back and he turns the volume up, love your style. All right, have I got anybody? Now don't be ashamed, I make a truckload of money here myself. Who lives in the world of talk? Yes, good to see you. Traditional's good. By the way, even if you start here, you've probably got it all. Yep, okay, for the cool dudes who are in the light blue, who's here? Oh look, there'd be 10 of you. Look, well that's good, because otherwise too many do call. Stops being cool. Who's in the yellow? Who works in uh, the yellow space? Look at oh, just the back row. Fantastic. Just the three of you. Oh, no. And beautiful with a shawl. That was you as well. Yep, fantastic. So that's about four of you. Who of you are in the pink realm? This is about building the capacity. Oh, look, just the two. Now, you wouldn't want to put a lot of effort into building other people's capacity, would you? Oh no, four, good on you, that's right. And uh, the rest of you, you're in the green? Nobody in the green. We're all in the green. All in the green, yeah. Anybody um, feel like you're in everything? Just the one of you, thanks for coming. Love it. <laughs> so the reality is your jobs may or may not um, fit across all of those. But the reality is, actually not just a practitioner reality, it's an impact reality for organisations. And so this is about when we think about doing great contemporary engagement, we need to think about two things to really make that real impact. And that's about having a consistent practice, which is where you might sit, but actually it's also about changing our organisations. If we are the only people in our organisations doing engagement, then actually it won't have enough impact. So we can't just have our focus looking externally, we need to also look internally to change the dynamic of how our organisations think and use engagement. Otherwise we're just not being serious about it. If we go home each night saying, I fought the good fight, you know, I made a difference, that's fantastic. If we go home each night and think, I fought the good fight, and those back in my organisations, they didn't, then a little part of us needs to feel like we haven't quite done the job. So when we think about contemporary engagement, the challenge is, of course, to do fantastic things with community. But it is about essentially looking to have impact. And if we're looking to have impact, if I think about the kind of thinking out of uh, Gary Hamill uh, in the innovation space, we need to aim for our practice to get better and different. And so that's about changing what we do. And when we think about the organisation, and we think about organisations who are good at engagement, who have engagement in their core soul of operating, in their practice, there are some very ordinary things that engaging organisations have. Whoops, not that. The top one is that they get engagement in their strategic intent they see others as part of the success for their own impact as an organisation. 
So we've got a client, the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. I don't know what the equivalent is in New South Wales. These people look after our uh, parks and things. Oh, wildlife. Wildlife. Parks and wildlife. National parks and wildlife. Um, so conservation, I think, has got a slightly larger um, remit. But um, essentially, they looked at the job they've got in front of them. A, we're a small country. And I said, actually, can't do it by ourselves. You can give us all the money you like, still couldn't do it. And so in their core strategic intent is an engagement intent, which is about basically moving more people into action and contribution, uh, corporates and individuals alike, in terms of their conservation contribution. We think engagement, the big change, is about how we do engagement. Here's the shock. It's not. It's almost irrelevant. The big change inside organisations is changing how we think about doing our work. Instead about starting our work programme with this is the list of all the things we need to do, it's to change that question to say this is the list of all the things we need to achieve and who are the best people who could be part of making that happen. And those people won't just be people inside your organisations. It is an ultimate challenge to the role and how we do our work. And so when we as practitioners aim to work with our internal clients, don't start the conversation with, and what would the workshop look like and which venue we should use. The question needs to be, and actually, what's the work you need to do? And who are the best people who can make that easier go faster or even better? And then, how do we engage them? It's the challenge of the conversation about work and role. The shift in terms of capability is that actually, um, it's not simply making sure you've got a skilled engagement team. You need a level of engagement, awareness and capability right through an organisation. And the boundaries of an organisation need to become more permeable because actually the test that we have as community members with our organisations is, is this community, in, is this organisation in tune with us? Do they get us? And so essentially, yes, yes. Um, so essentially your beautiful video was people saying, well, no, you know, they were interested in us. Yeah, actually, I think they got us. And that's high praise indeed. And so that needs to be us using our, to be in tune with the organisation because communities are great at sniffing out when you want to be liked and how you are normally. Yeah? And so that when you're obviously doing things where you want to be liked, and then you're not like that all the time, in effect you get a big year right. And you know what, how we act when an organisation isn't sincere. Yeah? We become a little more resistant. So when we think about an engaging organisation, the test for an organisation is where are you on the continuum? Are you at this end because you engage because you have to? Are you here because you've got some pockets of good practice? You know, you can name the people who are, have got it. Or are you here and actually you've got more than just a few people who've got it. You've got um, an organisation saying, actually, we need to be even better at this. Or are you over here saying, actually, we think we're pretty bloody close. Of course, we want to get better, but we think we're close to an engaging organisation. Draw the line on the card. Take a moment to think about where you think your organisation is. A recent survey of organisations um, basically popped them somewhere about here. Yeah. They've got friends and champions inside their organisation, but actually they know that if those people leave, it falls apart. And so when we look to being great practitioners, in an organisation, we need to help our organisation move along the continuum. 
if we are not just to be the people when we go home, feed the cat, and talk to them about the day we've had, where we say, oh, I did good work today, but those other ones, it's not success. And if you're going to change an organisation, and you're here, and you're new to it, then you just need to get started. If you're here, then, um, and you've got some good examples of great stories, then actually you do things like this. You hold fantastic showcases because these are instruments of infecting people in good practice. And I'm sure that that's your coming plan. Oh, did, were they not supposed to go, Alison? Okay, sorry. Just don't look like you don't know that. Yeah, that's right. If they're here, then actually you need a deliberate program of improving how you get good at things because accidents won't get you to the next bit. And if you're at this end, then you should apply for awards and tell the world what this looks like. And there are two or three organisations in Australasia starting to do that. But if we're going to put that together in numbers, and your decision makers will want numbers, then you'll look, and we, I just use the IOP2 spectrum as a front line for this, then you need to be able to not just say, we had these one or two people who really thought that we did a great job. You need to be able to tell a story where you got intensity of experience and you did scale. Yep, you did scale. And so to do that, that's about starting to um, measure what are the numbers of people who we touched, who noticed us, who learned some things. It's the lowest level set of measures. Yep. From there, it's about what are the numbers of people who started to off that base actually add into the conversation? What are the numbers of people who um, added something in a form of creating? or giving us a suggestion we didn't start with? Where are the organisations, what's the spread of people who are leading this conversation or this change on our behalf? And then essentially, the last one is an act and a measure of responsibility, which is essentially, where have we got people spontaneously acting without us? And that's the embedded test. They don't need us to do it. You don't tell the story of, oh, the funding stopped. They stopped. They just keep going. And so that if we're looking to measure the effectiveness of an organisation, those are the kind of metrics that we need to start to talk about. Who do we touch? What did they do? How much did they shape what happened? And did they move along to being people who are actually looking to act without us needing to pull them along. It's all on the slides. You're about to get them. But to do that, just as you need a portfolio of water measures, you need a portfolio of engagement. Because one workshop, beautiful practice, does not make one survey, beautiful practice, does not make one app, beautiful practice, does not make. And then if you're using, I loved when you looked at the Mary example. So is that with uh, Jess and Clear Horizon, that kind of process? Yeah. So we worked with Jess Dart and Clear Horizon and started to, have cre started to create rubrics of what quality practice looks like. So that actually you've got to change a mechanism for an organisation to know how well they're doing and expecting to know where they fit in that rubric of... Um, detrimental through to excellent. So this is us as that practitioners changing what we talk about inside our organisations. To stop talking about individuals, to stop talking about events and start to talk about impact. And impact across the community and get our internal clients familiar with the language of impact from the engagement point of view because that's what organisations are interested in. They could care less about happy, smiley faces at the end of a workshop. Don't you dare. Yep, 
That's for your personal satisfaction. From an organisational point of view, they see cost and not enough impact. And that means we need, if we're going to change our organisations, to change our practice. It means that we look, need to look to maximise the value that we create, and we need to be able to do it every day in a disciplined kind of way. It means that we need to have a design platform in place so our clients know and understand the context of the engagement, get the scope of people that they're engaging, and have a clear and defined purpose for engaging, and then have absolute clarity about the roles that people will play in creating that purpose, delivering on that purpose and making that impact. And so these are my five questions. Well, okay. There's sort of two questions in one, so technically it's five plus. <coughs> but that's only for the back row. For any piece of engagement, do we get the context? That's not a local question. That's an international question. If any of you have ever engaged in wind uh, power, you'll know that the playbook for communities in opposing wind power comes from the UK. You need to understand that's where it comes from. Same in water. Uh, the models for opposing water initiatives come from the states. The people who oppose what you're doing will know that as well. What's the essence of the problem or opportunity? Who is this community and who are the key players? Why the heck are you engaging? And if it's just to meet a legal requirement, don't spend too much money on it, just do it. Try not to be ashamed when you're in the community. <laughs> but be clear about what your purpose is. Because when you're clear about your purpose, you can therefore be clear about how you're going to measure success and what role can you and others play in the achievement of that purpose and that outcome. Engagement isn't about the stuff we do on the edge of the relationship between an organisation and a community. It embeds right into the core of who the organisation is and what's the role. It means that we need uh, changes that go from strategic projects to operational, and we need a diverse way of being able to engage, from small service, no fuss, to big ticket questions and items, which is what you've profiled this morning. And then when we start to get to this thing of contemporary engagement, here's your test. Is engagement integrated? Is it integrated into the work of the organisation? The second question is, do we engage with clear purpose and clear factors of success? Do we have clear purpose and clear factors of success? Do we use techniques and methods which actually deliver high touch and high tech, in other words, scale? Are we working the full engagement model? Are we working the full high? And finally, the question is actually when we look at all that we do, how strong is our portfolio? Integrated, <coughs> purposeful, high uh, touch, high tech, in other words, we've got spread and intensity. <coughs> do we work? all of the mechanisms and measures across engagement. And when we've done all of that, do we go home saying to the cat, we've got a beautiful portfolio. And by the way, it doesn't matter what you say to the cat, they all just want to be fed. <laughs> so you have to know it. When you think about contemporary engagement, 
however well you do it now, it needs to change, be stronger, different. It needs to be great in community, even better inside your organisation. Because otherwise, functions that live on the edge of an organisation, in times of constraint and challenge, drop off the edge. And that's not what communities expect, and it's not what organisations need. You have the perfect day to think about those things, because it's a fantastic programme you put together. I thank you for your attention. I know you're just about to be asked when you've got a question. You've probably only got time for one and a half of them. So um, take a moment to think about that, but I thank you for your attention.